in order to get us into chapter 8, I want to start by recalling those Euler circles that we were messing with last time. Two circles overlapping, creating this third space, this intersectional zone between the two. And I want to, in particular, focus on the high and the low tide marks in this littoral third zone that emerges when the two circles are overlapping. And if you're watching this, you can see what we're looking at here. On the right side, in the field known as land, think about this here, maybe we're on the west coast of California. So on the right hand side, you have land, this field of knowledge, the symbolic, this field also of the other, of production, particularly the production of surplus enjoyment. Recall also what we did with these Euler circles, is we took Lacan's basic definition of discourse and we slapped it into these Euler circles. So in the right-hand circle, you have other over product. In the left-hand circle, the circle of the sea, of jouissance, of the real, you have agent over truth. Truth being here approximations of sexual enjoyment all for the purposes of clarity. And then in the middle, you have the arrow of addressivity from agent to other, and you've got the delta of impotence in this littoral zone. So you can see this as I hold the diagram up again. You've got the C on one side with all of its jouissance, and then you've got land on the other side with all of its knowledge. And then you've got Lacan's basic formula for discourse, agent addressing the other resulting in the production of something, all the while a truth conditions the agent's semblance of agency that allows them to speak. Lacan's theory of discourse is also mapped onto these two circles. And what I want to call your attention to is not so much the littoral zone in between that is created when the circles overlap, but the two different shores that we have here. So, on the right, you have the high tide line. This is the highest point that the sea of jouissance washes up onto the land of knowledge. Here you see the real washing up into, onto the symbolic. Again, we're just speaking directly, plainly, bluntly for purposes of clarity. We illustrated this by saying that this is the field of the symptom. The symptom as directed, commanded by the unconscious. Symptoms, the field of appearance, always washing up onto shore and at high tide getting stuck as far inland as the tide will carry these symptoms, this litter, this debris, these letters that the unconscious coughs up. That's what you see in the high tide line. This purple line that you see on the screen in front of you is the furthest inland that the sea of jouissance with all of its unconscious formations washes up, leaving even as the tide recedes this purple line which would be strewn with the debris, with litter, with letters. This is what Lacan is up to, as we now know. Which brings us to the low tide line, where the water recedes furthest outland into the sea. The low tide line shows the symbolic edging toward the real. This low tide line is where we see not appearance, but measurement, not symptoms, but psychoanalysis. Psychoanalysis at the level of the mathem, the formula, the diagram that measures, and as Lacan says in chapter 8, verifies the universal curvatures, the squiggly lines, the debris that come washing up. So the purple high tide line is the line of the symptom as directed by the unconscious, and the yellow low tide line is that of psychoanalysis, measuring these symptoms using formulas, mathemes, and other forms of pure writing as they wash up. This is what we've got so far. This is what we've been working with, and it's what I want to keep us on point 
with regard to again. Again, let's hit it one more time, hit it better, because it's going to help us understand what happens in this really squiggly chapter, chapter 8 and seminar 18. What happens in and as the littoral zone during high tide? when jouissance washes up into the field of knowledge. What we see here, speaking plainly, is the real finding and taking a name. We see statements of impotence. We hear declarations of impossibility. We see signifiers blown to bits, crumbled into litter, into letters, all washing up and establishing this odd demarcation even when the tide recedes, this debris-strewn line, this high water mark, shown by symptomatic expressions. And the symptoms always say the same thing. I am at my limit. Beyond this point, I can speak no further. If you wanted to plug this back into Lacan's theory of discourse, particularly the discourse of the analyst, I would suggest that the S1 that you see being produced when the analyst and the analyzand get to talking, the S1 that the analyzand as a barred subject coughs up is just this, a piece of debris right on the edge of impotence. This is what we would see in a moment of high tide. The high tide of analytic experience is the coughing up of an S1, a new master signifier that grinds the associations to a halt because that signifier sits right up against the delta of impotence that we see in the bottom centerpiece of Lacan's theory of every discourse. In short, what we see at high tide is the real, at the level of the letter, washing up, overcoming the symbolic at the level of the word. So, zooming out even further, let's look again at this low tide mark. What happens in the littoral zone at low tide? The symbolic encroaches on the real. And here, via radical scientific inquiry, at the level of scientific thought known as psychoanalytic theory. Here is the math theme. Here is the formula. Here are letters turning real. Pure writing at the other tide line. The symbolic word here is being pushed out, stretched out, extended toward the real to its estimate limit. That's what low tide shows us. That's what formulas, math themes, diagrams in the field of psychoanalytic inquiry reveal. They show the symbolic at its limit, just as what we see at low tide is the formation of land at its limit relative to the sea of jouissance. Now this is where we've been. I don't want to spend much more time there. I do, however, want to add a couple of things, terms from chapter 8 that are going to put us on the path. In the sea of jouissance, where we see truth, you can also add what Lacan is doing here metaphorically with the image of light, L-I-G-H-T. Here you see something that is impossible vis-a-vis the symbolic. You can add light there. Truth is already in that category. Lacan is going to be messing around with truth and fiction. So on the right-hand side, In the circle represented by land, by knowledge, for truth, its counterpart fiction in chapter 8 is going to appear here in the field of land, of knowledge. So you're updating these Euler circles. On the left, truth is already there. You just need to add light. On the right, add fiction as the counterpart to truth that we see in chapter 8. And as the counterpart of light, add shadow. And at this point, you've got your Euler circles updated. C, jouissance, truth, the real, light on the left, land, knowledge, fiction, the symbolic, shadow on the right. And then, of course, you've got this 
intermediate zone, this liminal zone between, this littoral zone of pure writing, of the letter, where we see the delta of impotence popping. Namely, this field in which the parts of truth that can be said find expression as a kind of writing that always emerges as a statement of impossibility, a declaration of one's own limit in the case of the symptom. And really what we have here in both cases, at the level of symptomatic expression and psychoanalytic measurement, we have names of the real. And that is what is at stake in Seminar 18 so far, is the name of the real as pronounced in this thing known as real discourse, a discourse that is not indeed a semblance. Third pass at these high and low tides. Let's take it one more time running through this because it's that motherfucking important. High tide, this high water line. This is where we see aspects of the real, parts of truth finding expression in the symbolic, in discourse, in what Lacan calls everyday language, often as litter i.e. letters. We've talked about this in terms of symptomatic appearances commanded by the unconscious. What does that mean? What we see at the level of the symptom in this high water mark is not readily meaningful words, as you know, but utterly enigmatic letters. So, a letter here that is not a word could also be a nonverbal cue. It could be a shocked glance. It could be a paralinguistic cue, like a stutter or a stammer or a quick inhalation, assuming, of course, that you're not from Scandinavia, where this quick, quick Norwegian and Danish inhalation means something totally different. But in the neurotic West and North America, you see this inhalation as meaning something different. It functions as a letter. It functions as pure writing. It is not a word. Oh, well, and um, are these words? No, technically speaking, these are discourse particles. They are particles of words. They are fragments of words. Yes, you can look them up in the dictionary, so it takes us a little bit outside of paralinguistic and nonverbal cues. But these weird little oh, a, o, a, e, m, these vocalizations can also function as a kind of writing. And I think that's important to note here. Nonverbal codes are also part and parcel of pure writing in the field of symptomatic expression. The thing that we know about all of these parapraxies, call them what you will, what we're dealing with here are parapraxies at the level of the symptom, is the same thing that Lacan reiterates on page 136 of our PDF, just a couple paragraphs into chapter 8. No one will know anything about them. That's the nature of the symptom that we've been seeing from the start of Seminar 18 forward. Lacan's theory of the symptom here is moving away from symptoms as signifiers that carry meaning, readily available meaning, to symptoms as, as enigmas. Symptoms as now enigmatic letters, not meaningful words, but puzzling, bewildering letters, about which he's been saying the same thing throughout Seminar 18. No one will know or understand anything. It's also here at the front end of Chapter 8. He also, in Chapter 8, begins to discuss this high water line where symptoms wash up in all of their squiggly forms as a kind of truth in fiction. The fact, he says, that truth only progresses in a structure of fiction. You can see this on page 140 of our PDF. If you only have the chapter numbers, this would be page 6. He also discusses the sexual rapport, the sexual relationship in this moment, also on the same page. And he says that this is the point at which the sexual rapport, which does not exist, is real, is made into an affair of state, 
woven into the fabric of the symbolic. That's what you see at high tide when the water line is up, is you see impossibilities being woven into the texture of the symbolic. The same way that the letter, when it passes from hand to hand to hand to hand, here think epistolary text, it turns the sexual rapport that it conceals and fantasizes into an affair of state, into a signifier in the field of the symbolic. Now again, we're moving fast and we're moving loose here, and all for purposes of clarity. The stakes are quite a bit different and I believe quite a bit higher in chapter 8. But this review, I think, is important here now in our third pass on these high and low watermarks. So let's talk about that low water line one more time. Here, where language, the signifier, the symbolic, are all pushed to their extimate limit, causing words to break into letters, mathemes, formulas, diagrams, graphs, and the like. The pure writing that you see at the low water mark at the outer, uh, outer, inner, extimate reaches of land, of knowledge. This is where you see radical scientific inquiry. Par excellence, psychoanalytic thought. Radical scientific measurements of symptomatic appearances occur here. Written by the psychoanalyst. And the psychoanalyst, not so much as a practitioner, of this technique known as psychoanalysis, but as a theorist at stake in the low water line where the symbolic edges onto the real, is the psychoanalyst as the psychoanalytic theorist. From the Greek verb thea, meaning to see. Psychoanalytic theory as pure writing is a kind of Bios theoreticos, in the Aristotelian sense. It's a life lived by someone who watches, observes, assesses, and measures phenomena. Don't forget, the Greek figure of the theoros is not the philosopher. The theoros is not the philosopher. Thea is also the origin of the verb, or the word theater. To see was something that happened whenever you went to a theatrical performance, hence theory and theater having the same etymological root in the Greek, theros. The theros in antiquity was a traveling judge of theatrical performances. So the theros was somebody who went to a different town, checked out a performance that was happening there, the clouds perhaps, and then reported back to his or her hometown and sized up that performance, reported back on what they had seen. They go, they see, and then they report back with assessments, verifications of what it is that they have seen. This is what psychoanalytic theory is up to in the field of measurement at this low water line, where the name of the real is named at the level of the math theme, the formula, the diagram, and the graph. Here is the analyst as theros, an itinerant traveling judge of performances, of appearances, who can then assess, verify, measure, and account for in pure writing at the level of the mathem, at the level of the diagram, what it is that they have seen washing up onto their shores. The word Lacan uses in chapter 8 for this, as you've heard me refer to it here, is verification. You can see it just a few pages in to chapter 8. Page 140 in the PDF, page 6, where he starts talking about this wall of verification. And I think it's worth building up to this because it allows us to also discuss this bit about truth and the structure of fiction. Check this out. It begins about the middle of page 140, page 6, if you've got the chapter pagination. He says, the truth only progresses, only progresses from a structure of fiction. And we'll come to that when we get to light and shadows, and I think it'll become a little more clear. 
namely, that precisely in its essence, it is from the fact that there is promoted somewhere a structure of fiction, which is properly the very essence of language, that something can be produced which is what? But precisely this sort of questioning, this sort of pressure of circumscribing, which puts the truth, as I might say, up against the wall of verification. That's what this low water line is. It's the wall of verification, where circumscriptions of truth at the level of the symptom can be made. Now, hold off on the fiction part. It'll become clear as he passes it again. Right now, we're just zeroed in on this notion of verification. The job of the radical psychoanalytic theorist is not just to measure the squiggles that wash up on the analytic shore, but to also verify them, to verify the symptom at some level. Let's see if we can understand what Lacan means by this. That is nothing other than the dimension of science, he says about this verification process. This is what shows precisely that as regards the path by which there is motivated, the path by which we see science progressing, the fact is that logic plays no small part in it. And I want you to be really careful about this. Science, as Lacan discusses it, doesn't always equal psychoanalysis. However, radical scientific logical inquiry as Lacan understands it, does include within it psychoanalytic theory. So whenever I bring up science and make it akin to psychoanalysis, I'm thinking of radical scientific inquiry, not basic bitch modern science stuff. I'm thinking about radical scientific inquiry as Lacan theorizes it in Seminar 17. This is science that is always working at the outer limits of its ability to continue being scientific. Always coming up with formulas that are pointed at, working at the edge of the whole in knowledge. The edge of the whole in every discipline. Every discipline can have radical scientific inquiry. This is not the work of the scientist that maintains the established epistemology of any given discipline. This is the work of the scientist that is always trying to find where that knowledge begins to break down, where it opens up into a field of unknown experience, unknown events, unknown entities. This is radical scientific inquiry, always working, measuring, formulating, using letters to name the edge of the whole, to assess and verify the edge of the whole in their discipline. And that, I believe, is akin to what Lacan understands here as psychoanalytic theory, the job of psychoanalytic theory at the level of the diagram, the graph, the mathem, and the formula. So science here, I believe what he's talking about is radical scientific inquiry of the psychoanalytic sort in particular. This is what shows precisely that as regards the path by which there is motivated, the path by which we see science progressing, the fact is that logic plays no small part in it. Whatever may be the originally, fundamentally, basically fictitious character of what makes up the material by which language is articulated, it is clear that there is a path that is called verification. It is what is attached to grasping where the fiction, as I might say, comes up short, and what brings it to a halt. That's why I say that radical scientific inquiry is always working at measuring and mathematizing the edge of the whole in any given knowledge system, in any given epistemology. That's what he means here. The type of verification work that is happening in the field of radical scientific inquiry, it is what is attached to grasping where fiction, here epistemology, here language, here disciplinarity, here knowledge. This is all the shit that we see happening on the land as a field of the symbolic. That's what he means by fiction. 
and radical scientific inquiry, he says, is trying to grasp where this fiction, where knowledge, where discipline, where epistemology, where readily meaningful discourse comes up short. In other words, trying to find the point where this line of inquiry grinds to a halt. You see, the symptom, as S1 produced in the discourse of analysis, shows the analyzand grinding to a halt. Here, what we're looking at is the way an entire discipline can grind to a halt, not at the high tide moment, where the symptom washes up, but at this low tide moment, where the symbolic starts to break down where you're left with not readily available written descriptions, but formulae, diagrams, graphs, and the like, all of which are designed to verify, to measure, to verify, to account for, to observe and report back on the outer edge of any one given discipline or epistemology. It is clear that here, whatever it may be that has allowed us to write and you will later see what that means, the progress of logic. I mean the written path along which it has progressed. It is clear that this checking is quite efficacious because it is inscribed within the very system of a fiction. So the verifying, the checking, the measurements, the formulas and the like, Lacan's very careful to put this where? Squarely on land. It may be at the very edge of land, and it may only occur in those slight moments when the tide has receded far enough for you to walk to that edge, to that low tide mark. But you are still in the system of fiction. Pure writing at the level of psychoanalytic theory is still occurring in the realm of the symbolic. It is just the symbolic right on the edge of the void. It's the symbolic when it names the real. That's what he's up to here when he talks about verification, this checking that remains nevertheless within the system of fiction. The point here is that it's at the very outer limit of that fiction that we see this verification occurring. So when the symbolic fiction of knowledge, of epistemology, of disciplinarity comes up short where it grinds to a halt, runs into a wall. That's a great image here as well. This is where we see radical scientific inquiry taking flight. This is where it begins to observe, to graph, to chart. This is where it takes its aerial view of a certain low tide mark. This is where it begins to observe, measure, and crucially to write. Let me be precise one more time and ask the question, where again does all of this writing occur? What line does this writing mark? The very thing that Lacan referred to earlier and that you've heard me say multiple times in the past few lectures, the very thing that he describes as the edge of the whole in knowledge. This is not knowledge and it is not the whole. Pure writing at the level of radical psychoanalytic theory occurs at the edge of the whole in knowledge. I believe this is another good reason to read Lacan in the wake of Kant, not just in the wake of Hegel, but more precisely even in the wake of Kant as an Enlightenment thinker. And isn't that a wild thing to say? Not for some of you. Some of you know Kant well enough to understand that reading Kant is terrific training for understanding how Lacan thinks as a theorist. Hegel is helpful as hell, too. But the entire German idealist tradition, bookended by Kant on one end and Hegel on the other, is what you need, I think, to really make great sense of how Lacan is operating. And isn't that what you see in your typically respected commentators on Lacanian theory and technique? These are folks who have read and absorbed German idealism. Now you wanna say maybe German idealism extends not to Hegel, but to Kierkegaard? I'm down with that perspective as well. 
Throw Kierkegaard in the mix as well. He's my homeboy. And I think you've got the really basic intellectual bedrocks atop which you can build something like Lacanian psychoanalysis. All I want to emphasize here is that in chapter 8, Lacan sounds to me more like a Kantian than he does a Kierkegaardian, to say nothing of him being a Hegelian. Lacan sounds a lot like an Enlightenment thinker in chapter 8 of Seminar 18. Not phenomenology, but critique in the Enlightenment sense seems to be on his brain. Check out, for instance, the bottom of page, let's see, 141, top of 142, just below where we were messing around with truth being verifiable, but only ever in the field of fiction, inscribable in the field of fiction, even if at its outer limit. Or you can have it be an inner limit either. I don't think at this point you need to have things precisely buttoned down in terms of what this edge is. I don't think that's essential to understanding in a clear, coherent way what Lacan is up to here. It doesn't mean we couldn't drill down and really sharpen all that up as we've done before, but we don't need to do it right now in order to make sense of what he's doing here. Here what he's doing is just rehearsing a really basic Enlightenment era approach to light and shadow. This is not a platonic approach to light and shadow. This ain't the allegory of the cave, baby. He's talking about the Enlightenment here. And in fact, he even cues it up. Aufklärung, he brings up at the bottom of page 141, chapter, uh, page 7 in chapter 8, if you've got only the page numbers. And what does he say? I am speaking about the historical epoch, of course, which was not short, and it may be of use to us. It is so here, and this is what I'm doing to retrace its paths or to take them up again. What is the epoch he's talking about? He's talking about the Enlightenment era. And what he's saying is that by going back to this historical epoch and retracing some of its conceptual paths and taking them up again even, we may find some insights that can be of use to us, he says, as psychoanalytic theorists. It's a very interesting move. Let's notice how he ramps up to this. The paragraph begins, of course. Of course it is here that we touch on the importance of this notion, the function of the shadow. Inasmuch as already the last time I stated to you what precisely a writing is, I mean something that presented itself in a literal or literary form. The shadow, in order to be produced, needs a source of light. So what Lacan is messing with here is simply how the physics of a shadow operate. In order for a shadow to be cast, there must be a light. Yes, and what I did was only tangible for you because of what is involved in the Aufklärung, the Enlightenment. And he uses even the German here. So he's talking about the German Enlightenment. And who is the central figure of the German Enlightenment? Don't say King Frederick. Uh-uh, I'm not messing with that. It's Kant. Kant is the figure of the German Enlightenment, par excellence. There were many, but Kant was the centerpiece there in hindsight, I think we could say. And then you hear this riff from him being very clear that what he's talking about is not enlightened sensibilities. It's not a generic use of the word enlightened. He's got the German here, and he's using it to designate a historical period that he wants to somehow return to with this image of shadow in order to being produced needing a source of light. Aufklaren, enlightenment. You can see what he's up to here. We don't need to belabor this point. But in themselves, Lacan continues after this riff on the Aufklärung, it is clear that what creates the light is precisely what, starting from this field, defines itself as being that of truth. So truth is the light source, and the light casts, hits an opaque object, and a shadow is formed. And it is as such, as such a way, that the light that it spreads at every instant, even if it has this effect, 
effective by the fact that what is opaque in it projects a shadow, and that it is this shadow which carries the effect, the truth effect. That we are always, that we always have to question this truth itself about its structure as a fiction. So what are we to make of all this? Let me see if we can come up with some summative statements to account for this riff on truth and fiction, light and shadow, to say nothing of the opaque structures in the field of fiction, if you will, in the field of the symbolic, the land forms that light strikes, casting shadows as a result. Here's how I'm reading this. Just as shadows need a source of light in order to appear, think here the unconscious resulting in symptoms, so also does the measurement and assessment and verification of light sources occur in the realm of shadows. Here, the realm of shadows is that of language, discourse, signifying articulation. Albeit only ever at the furthest reaches of language, discourse, signifying articulation. Not where we see words, but where we see letters. Not where we hear speech, but where we hear pure writing occasioning spoken discourse. It's by way of shadows cast, let me be clear, that we verify sources of light. You can look at the sun. You can stare the sun down all day long. But it's the shadows on the ground that more safely and readily tell me where the sun is in the sky. Yeah, I can turn my face directly to it. My retinal specialist is not going to be very happy about this. But it's by way of the shadows on the ground when I'm out maneuvering through the wilds of California, that tell me where the sun is in the sky. Truth works similarly. It can only be inscribed in the realm of fiction, as appearance and measurement alike, symptom and matheme alike. This is what we know about truth. There is a part of it that cannot be said. All the more reason not to stare it in the eyes. And there is this other part of it that can be said. The place where these statements can occur is on land, not out to sea, not in the field of jouissance, but in the field of the symbolic, in the field of shadows, in the field of fiction. But this begs a question. It's the crucial question in chapter 8, the one that you would think on surface may have nothing to do with what we've been talking about. What does all of this have to do with the sexual relationship, which is a key topic in chapter 8 of Seminar 18? Technically speaking, the sexual rapport does not exist. And you can hear rapport as relationship, but you can also think about it as proportion, ratio, and the like. Technically speaking, that shit doesn't exist. For the simple reason that the sexual relationship, as Lacan understands it, is an idea, not an existent. We'll come to that in a second. It's another Kantian phenomenon for us to consider. However, the sexual relationship nevertheless shows up. Ah, but only as its failure. The same way that the big other doesn't exist but it keeps showing up in the form of lacking, big, barred others. And if you've seen our series on Seminar 16 and on their excised subsets known as S2s, which are not closed epistemological structures, these S2s, but they are open systems, ever-evolving and grappling with weird little S1s that wash up onto their shores. I would suggest that it's here that we can observe, measure, and verify. Not the sexual relationship, but its failure. It's on shore that we can verify in writing via radical scientific inquiry in the field of psychoanalytic theory, where every practitioner is a theoros, how the sexual relationship washes up at the level of the letter. Not at the level of the word, but at the level of the letter. 
at the level of failure, at the level of a word broken. Lacan, for his point, is that the sexual relationship cannot be written. He says this on page 143, just a couple paragraphs after where we've been. Page 9, if you've just got the chapter in front of you. But here's the thing. Lacan tells us the sexual relationship cannot be written. That shit doesn't exist. You can't write it. Ah, but check it out. That sentence, that declaration of impossibility can be written. In fact, you can turn to page 143 or page 9 and you can see the relationship. The sexual relationship cannot be written. Yes, the sexual relationship cannot be written, but that statement of impossibility can be written down. It can be written down as an inscription of limitation, a statement of one's limits, as an inscription of what Lacan calls on 135, an inscription of an obstacle to a certain type of inscription. You can write down and document at the level of pure writing all of the obstacles to certain types of inscription. So check it out. Here it is. The sexual relationship cannot be written, but the sentence you just heard me state can be written. In fact, it's written in the text in front of us here. It can be written as a declaration or a statement of impossibility, as an inscription of limitation, as the inscription of what Lacan once more calls an obstacle to a certain type of inscription. There are certain types of inscription that cannot occur, but you can write about that shit. You can document, display, measure at the level of the formula, at the level of the graph, at the level of the mathem, at the level of the letter, these obstacles to certain types of inscription. As what? You've heard it from me before. They are displayed as names of the real. Or more precisely, and at this point put more archly, as real discourse. Declarations, statements, names, inscriptions of this sort, all the things we've been discussing in this series. They all function as pure writings in this littoral zone between knowledge and jouissance, symbolic lands and seas of the real. The function of these littoral writings is twofold, I believe. First, the function of these littoral, littoral writings in this liminal beachhead between knowledge and jouissance is first to replace the signifier with the letter. Signifiers go away and letters are left behind, if you want to think of it that way. Again, the image of a beach with waves crashing up, not a bad way to do this. You can take almost anything man-made or otherwise, and put it on a beach. And given enough time with enough waves, the sea will break that shit down as it washes up onto the land. What else is sand, fine or otherwise, but rock that has been broken down over time, a huge rock broken into these little bitty pieces and parts of it, so small you can't even see them with your uh, own two eyes. When this happens, when the signifier gives way to the letter, to litter, when the plastic bottle gives way only to the plastic particle, if you want to think back to Lacan's riff on pollution, contamination, and our own environmental catastrophe, what happens, Lacan says, is in this moment, a hole is drilled, he says, into the texture of the symbolic, effectively grinding ordinary language use to a halt, causing it to, again, come up short, to fail, to stammer in the face of a certain wall, obstacle, barrier. You're hearing now all of the imagery that he's been using coming into focus here. When signifiers give way to letters, these letters have this effect of drilling a hole into symbolic use, into ordinary language use, and causing ordinary language to stammer, to stutter, to stumble. All of this, by the way, is also occurring, technically speaking, on land, in the field of signifying articulation. 
even if it can only be seen as the tide recedes, bringing us right to this low tide point. To illustrate this, and if you've read the chapter, you know exactly the passage I have in mind, Lacan turns once more to Aristotelian logic, to the syllogistic premise that every man is good. And this is how we start getting toward the sexual relationship. It's on page 144 of the text that we've been considering here. Page 10, if you're looking at just the chapter headlines of the English translation that we're working with here. Let's see how he sets this up. Nothing in any case can function, can function except by substituting into the texture of discourse to substitute for the signifier the whole made by replacing it by the letter. So, just to be clear, what you're hearing from me always in these series is not some shit that I'm making up. It's straight from the text. Here it is. Here it is right here, what I'm talking about, the two basic functions of pure writing between knowledge and jouissance. The first being to have the signifier replaced with the letter and the letter drilling a hole in the symbolic. Here it is. Nothing in any case can function, can function except by substituting into the texture of discourse to substitute for the signifier the whole made by replacing it by the letter. Because if we state the following, just taking Dari, that is to use Aristotle's terms, every man is good. And then Lacan gets us to the point we want. The every man is the universal. And I have sufficiently underlined for you, sufficiently prepared you in any case to understand the fact that I can with nothing else recall that the universal does not have in order to stand up the need for the existence of any man. So the first thing I want to call your attention to here is his use of underline. Underline is a common word that's popping up here in chapter 8. What does it look like when you underline a word or a letter or a phrase? What does it look like when you underline text? It creates a horizontal line, a horizontal bar. The horizontal bar that we've been messing with as that between signifier and signified, between agent and truth, the horizontal bar that's been so relevant for us the past couple of lectures. Here you're in this bizarre liminal zone where underlining is also a word he's using to suggest, again, a horizontal bar. And it is precisely that horizontal bar that he will then focus on when he turns to masculine and feminine subjectivities as this horizontal bar of negation that he places above the letter contorted upside down and backwards that he uses to capture this thing known as the universal. So don't fuck around here. The stakes are high with these underlines, but that's not the main point. The main point here, in addition to noticing all these underlines, I'd say, is that Lacan's saying, listen, I've already got you ramped up to understand what's up with the universal. This quote, every man or all men, you heard it last time, and all women. He's saying, I've already got you ramped up. I don't need to tell you anything more about how this shit works. But what he does recall is the following. The universal as a total, complete, full set of any given entity does not have, in order to stand up, the need for the existence of any particular entity. The universal is something distinct from the entities that it contains, that it totalizes. All men, every man, is somehow distinct from each and every individual man that it collects and totalizes in its absolute count, known as every man. Does this sound familiar to you? It ought to, because what we're talking about here is the difference between containers and things contained. What we're talking about here is the difference between the waste basket and all the publications we throw into them. The total, complete, universal category of every man does not exist. It certainly doesn't exist like the men of which it is comprised. That's important here. 
nor does it even need the existence of these individual men, as Lacan says here, to be what it is. This total, complete, universal category known as every man, it doesn't need any particular individual man in order to be what it is, namely an abstract, totalizing collection. In short, a complete set. A set of everything. Does this sound familiar to you? It should also, with regard to what we've been discussing about the big other, that shit doesn't exist. Meta language, that shit doesn't exist. Ah, except at the level of the idea, except as universals. That's the point Lacan is making here. These are the insights that he doesn't need to underline anymore for us because what he's saying is, you already know all this shit about universals. And so now he's going to try and do something with this. Here's the thing that I want to remind you. Yes, the big other doesn't exist. Yes, meta-language doesn't exist. Yes, every man, all men, does not exist. These totalizing complete sets do not, technically speaking, exist. Ah, but here we are again. We can state as much about them. We can discuss their impossibility. We can name the impossibility of the big, full other. We can name, write, and formulate the impossibility of a meta-language. And we can just keep going on in this direction. We use letters, the littoral fragments of words. We can use the littoral fragments of words that have been crushed and crumbled and broken apart into all their constitutive squiggles on the beachhead between knowledge and jouissance to inscribe all of these impossibilities. They can all be written at the level of the letter. This is what Lacan is getting to here. Isn't this exactly also what he was up to with the woman in chapter 6? The woman, recall this, like all the women in the myth of the father of the primal horde, doesn't exist for Lacan at this point in his thought, except at the level of the mythic enigmatic, highly elusive letters that look like this. A capital S next to parens barred big A. You'll recall this from chapter 6. We touched on it in our lecture as well. The woman, like all the women, doesn't exist except as a signifier of something that doesn't exist in the field of the symbolic, something that the symbolic is lacking. Isn't this exactly why phallo-logocentric, hyper-heteronormative, downright misogynist social orders like ours are always trying to objectify, commodify, fragment, and control the living individual bodies of those who present to us as feminine? And all for the surplus enjoyment, read phallic, masculine jouissance, of their no less sexed counterparts, these so-called masculine subjectivities. This is what's at stake. This is what we're working toward. This is what's at stake in the second half of chapter eight. Don't get it twisted. The sexual relation, like the woman, may not exist, but sexed relations certainly do. Notice how Lacan even parses this distinction pretty clearly for us. And I don't, don't even get me started on the type of sexual relations in the sense of intercourse that we living beings have all the time. Or though, let me be clear, at least that we dream about having all the time. And that's an important part here. Not to say that you don't get enough sex, but to say that we're always dreaming of a little bit more to a lot more and all occurring without limit unconstrained by the castrative logics of self and society. That's part and parcel what the myth of the father of the primal horde preserves is this fantasy of unlimited, unconstrained, uncastrated sexual 
relations in the sense of fucking. Not one woman, but all the women. Not one man, but all the man. If we can give Lacan the second twist that I think his insight truly deserves. How else? And let me be clear what I mean by this. With which additional letters can we write the impossible universals that we've been discussing? Every man... Every woman, all women, how can we write this? Are there other letters that we can draw upon to help us make sense? Recall, again, that the fundamental fantasy of the big other's existence always founders on the same thing, signifiers of the fact that the other is always already barred, lacking, and incomplete. That's what I just showed you, a signifier of the fact that the big other is only ever the barred other. Now, we typically write all of this as Lacan writes it in the graph of desire, where in the bottom right-hand quadrant, you see a capital A that is not barred. There's your full fantastical big other, this treasure trove of signifiers as he was discussing in the early 60s. In the upper left-hand quadrant of the complete graph of desire, this is where you see the image I just showed you, the letters I just showed you, the letters that I pulled directly from chapter 6 of seminar 18, of a signifier next to a barred A in parens. Typically, these are the letters that we use to document this matter. In seminar 18, however, and not just in chapter 8, 10 years after the graph of desire, Lacan gives us another letter to work with. It is not the signifier of the barred other that you see in the S with a barred A in parens, but instead, notice this, it is an up upside down capital A. The letter that he is bringing to bear on this impossible universal at the level of all men, all women, is an upside down A, an upside down capital A, if we can use words to describe this totally non-verbalizable entity that looks like, as Lacan says multiple times in seminar 18, a bull's head. Take a capital A, turn it upside down, and you've got the basic etching image of a bull's head. This, however, is not even a letter anymore. It's something different. Big A upside down is not big A right side up. Is also not the signifier capital S next to a barred big A. A capital A turned upside down, according to Lacan, is an unverbalizable notation. It is not part of any given spoken discourse. Ah, but it can definitely be written on the chalkboard. And that's why it's hilarious. In these lectures that he's giving, in 1970, people are like, bro, we can't hear you. We can't hear you in the back. And it's, it's me, and he's like, what? What are you saying here? What's going on? He's kind of got this old man. And, what? What, well, who's saying something? Listen. Listen to what else he says, though, in these moments. Someone says, hey, we can't hear you. It's from chapter 6 in seminar 18. And he says, don't complain that you can't hear me. He's shouting this, presumably, back at the audience. And he says, what is at stake can only be written on the blackboard. In other words, you don't need to hear anything. What is at stake in Seminar 18 at the level of a discourse that is not a semblance, that is a real discourse, keep going with this in the direction of pure writing, keep going with this at the level of Chinese and Japanese characters in the margin, keep going with this at the level of astrological, astronomical phenomena in the night sky. Keep going with this at the level of his blackboard of the night sky. What's at stake here is not something that can or even needs to be said. Yes, it will occasion discourse, hence the seminar. But what he's saying is what's at stake really can only be written. 
And that's what you see here with the capital A upside down. I dare you to tell me what that is. Say that. Say it. You can't say it. You can say a capital A written upside down as I've done. The only way to account for this is at the level of writing, is at the level of a letter that really isn't even a letter anymore. It's more of a bull's head than anything. This is Lacan's point. You don't need to fucking hear him. Hell, maybe he even turned the mic down on purpose, because what's really at stake is only what he's writing on the blackboard. And where, again, is Lacan's blackboard? It's in the same place that we find the Chinese characters, namely in the margin of the text before us, which is also, again, the same place that when you set this text down and decide to walk your dog and see what the fuck is going on, as I often do, this is what you see in the stars across the night sky. You are still looking at Lacan's blackboard when you walk under the starry sky. Yet another reason to read Kant alongside Lacan. Those with ears to hear know exactly what I'm talking about. When Lacan writes an upside-down capital A on the board, let's be clear, he is writing at the edge of the hole in knowledge that we've been talking about. And in so doing, he's marking this edge. He's using pure writing to measure, to verify the universal curvature that we have discussed. At issue here is not the high water mark of the real, let me be clear, but the low water mark of the symbolic. Remember, it's impossible to write universals like all women, every man and the like. But this pronouncement, once again, this statement of impossibility that I just issued, namely that it's impossible to write universals, can absolutely be written down, formulated, observed, verified, and the like, as one more name of the real, one more instance of what we're calling real discourse. Whether we're talking about an upside-down A, or if you've seen Lacan's formulas for masculine and feminine subject positions, a backwards capital E, which is also where we are headed. And again, the same is true of the big other, meta-language, the woman, the sexual relationship. They're ideas. They are not existence. An idea is never going to walk up your driveway and knock on your door. You can, following Kant, use ideas as maxims for right living. The idea of justice doesn't need to exist for you to live a life trending in its direction. Ideas are not existence. Relative to the symbolic, they don't exist. Even if, by way of the symbolic, we can designate their existence. Remember what Lacan is doing with existence. From the Greek, ekstasis standing outside, and what do we find beyond the reach of the symbolic? I believe the formulas for masculine and feminine subjectivities that Lacan is working up towards the end of chapter 8 are all trending in this direction, toward the conceptual and experiential difference between existence in the field of the symbolic and existence, ecstasis, relative to this field. Not as it's, its edge, per se, but really I want to cut to the chase, indeed, as it's beyond, the beyond of this existence. As we've seen in previous series, really since our series on Seminar 14, Lacan has been talking about the non-existence of the sexual act and now the sexual relationship for quite a while. He's been working at this for, for more than a minute. This didn't just come out of nowhere. But I want to suggest that it's really only here, in Seminar 18, that Lacan really starts getting serious about the subjectivities that are bound up in this non-existence. One masculine, another feminine, and neither, hear me now, with 
anything whatsoever to do with human anatomy. Men and women, like fathers and mothers, are for Lacan functions, operations, subject positions. They are, let me be even more precise, they are structural operators. So what we did in previous series around the paternal function and the maternal function, the paternal figure and the maternal figure, as we transitioned from imaginary pre oedipal triangles to symbolic castrated squares, here, daddy is an operation. Mommy is a held place. And these are operations that can be performed by anybody sometimes even people that are dead and non-existent. Baby Jesus can perform the paternal function, assuming that's who your mother invokes. And your mother needn't be the one whose belly you slithered out of all those years ago. I can play the mommy. You can be the mommy. You don't need to give birth to a child in order to be its mommy. Ask any single dad. Ask any father who is deeply engaged in the life and times of their child, who the primary caregiver is in that child's life. Be the mommy and the daddy, and then talk to me about the anatomical demands of motherhood, the anatomical demands of fatherhood. For Lacan, it's not about anatomy. Moms and dads, men and women, they are subject positions that any body if pressed in the right way, can fill. Men can become mommies. Women can become daddies. Their sons can grow up to be women, and their daughters can grow up to be men. I want to stress this so that we do not get it twisted. So let's start with these so-called men. The first formula Lacan presents in chapter 8 is masculine and probably fairly familiar to you, especially if you've read ahead into some of his other seminars. It looks something like this. You've got the upside down big A next to an X, and then you've got the signifier for the symbolic phallus or just the phallus. This is the signifier for castration next to another X. And the X is going to be men or women, but here we're dealing with men. And here's how we read this particular formula, the first formula that we see popping in chapter 8. This first instance of pure writing relative to masculine subject positions. For all men, don't forget the capital A upside down is the letter Lacan is inverting to create a written representation, if you will, a writing of the universal. So anytime you see this big A upside down, it means for all X's. Here we're talking about men, so X is men. For all men, here's the universal, for all men, the phallic function represented by the capital I with a circle through it, is valid. And that little X here says it's valid for these men. For all men, the phallic function is valid. Now, what does this mean? This bit of pure writing, what does it tell us? What's the discourse that we can speak atop it? It says that all masculine subjectivities are castrated. To be a masculinized subject in today's world is to be castrated, Lacan is claiming. All so-called men endure castration. But this, in turn, implies another formula, one that's not presented in chapter 8, but I think is still worth us trotting out here. It looks something like this. And now we get another weird usage of a letter. Here you don't see an A upside down, but an E that has been flipped backwards. A capital E flipped backwards next to an X. And then you've got the signifier for the phallic experience of castration 
next to another x. And above the phallic function here, is what this means, you see a line, a horizontal bar. This means negation. It negates whatever is underneath it. Lacan is careful, but also kind of unclearly trying to point this out in chapter 8. The horizontal bar in question here in chapter 8 is not that which divides signifiers from signifieds. It's that which negates whatever comes underneath it. So the capital E that's been flipped backwards means sum. Upside down big A means all. Capital E flipped backwards means sum. And here's how we read this second formula for masculinity. In order for the first formula to account for and do its work of universalizing all men, the first thing you want to notice here is that this second formula is occasioned by the work that the first formula is doing when it tries to universalize all men. And once we start there, then you can see precisely what this second formula means. So in order for the first formula, this one with an upside down A, X next to the I with a circle through it and the, and the X that says, for all men the phallic function is valid. In other words, all masculine subjectivities are castrated. In order for this universal claim all men are castrated, to work in order for this total complete set of all men to operate, in order for this first formula to account for that operation for all men, thereby resulting in a total complete set comprised of each and every man, you see it's a universal, there has to be one man in particular who is excluded from this set of all men, and truly peculiar as a result. And you know how this logic works. We've talked about this logic before. If everything for the camping trip is packed, you got to stop the car and turn around because nothing has been left out. Nothing has been left behind. Nothing has been excluded from the complete and whole packing job that you did for this camping trip. This is the logic that Lacan is working with here once again in these two formulas. In order for all men to endure and be defined by castrative logics, there have to be some men, some one man in particular, who eludes this logic. The only way to guarantee a complete whole set of everything is to make sure that nothing is excluded. Nothing has to be left out in order for the set of everything to hang together. That's how Lacan is thinking this through. That's how he's arriving at his formulas of masculinity. I'll show you the passages here in a second. The second formula accounts for this logical necessity. And here's how it reads. There is always at least one man, that's the backwards EX, some man, one man, there's always somebody, some man, who is not submitted to the phallic function. That's what the negation above the phallic signifier here means. It means that there's always somebody who eludes castrative logic. There's always someone who is not like all men, ruled by the phallic function, someone who is not submitted to its rule. In other words, someone who is not castrated. So the first formula reads, all men are castrated. The second formula reminds you that in order for the category of all men to hold, there has to be someone who is not castrated not included in that category, someone whose position relative to that categorization is nothing. And Lacan is now searching for, with the second formula, who this motherfucker is. Who is this one person who is not, hence the line above phallic signifier, who is not castrated? If all men are truly castrated, then there must be one person excluded from that count, nothing relative to that count, who is not. Who or what 
my dear friends, is this exceptional man. Why, it's the mythic father of the primal horde, of course. This mythically unconstrained, fantastically uncastrated man who supposedly enjoys exclusive access to, quote, all the women. And if you want some passages for this, passages that I think are just fabulous, because it shows Lacan trying his best to explain this logic to his audience, you can start on page 151 of the PDF and then go to 152. It's page 17 of the chapter, if you're looking at the chapter pages, or 18 of the chapter. It's about midway down, just above another formula that we'll talk about in a minute. Here's what he says about man, about men. Man is a phallic function, insofar as he is every man. But as you know, there are the greatest doubts to be had about the fact that, quote, every man, or italicized, every man exists. This is what is at stake. It is that he can only be so under the heading of every man, namely a signifier, nothing more. You don't need the signifier part for this in order to understand how Lacan is thinking it through. He's saying in order to be a man, you have to be included in this category known as all men. But he's saying here that there's something about that categorization that makes its existence questionable. All men is never going to walk up your driveway and knock on your door. So how on earth is it supposed to be guaranteed? What is the guarantee that allows this totalizing set known as every man to hold water? Or in this case, men, to hang together. In this case, (laughs) I'm not even going to push that metaphor any further about hanging and the like. Next page is the one where Lacan tries to hit it again and explain what needs to be done in order to make the totalizing set known as all men hold together. Nothing can be grounded about the status of man, he says on the next page. I mean seen from analytic experience, except by constructing artificially, mythically, this every man with this presumed one. The presumed one He says, by God, it's the mythical father of totem and taboo, namely the one who is capable of satisfying the enjoyment of all the women. It's right here on page 18 in the chapter 152. You can read it for yourself. Once more, I want to illustrate I am not just making this shit up. In order for all men to suffer and be defined by castrative logics, as the first formula states, in order for this universal claim about men to operate and to function, there has to be one person who is kicked out of the totalizing set. In order for everything to be included, every man to be included, one man who is nothing relative to this collection of everything has to be left out, has to be excluded. Now you can see why it's been so important for us to keep working this container thing contained everything relative to nothing logic from seminar 14 forward. It's precisely here that Lacan is building his understanding of masculine subjectivity atop this basic line of thought around total sets that contain everything and the exclusion of nothing that has to occur in order for that set of everything to remain valid. The mythical father that we're talking about here, don't forget, this is the father of everyone else's castration as well. This is the father of the unary stroke. This is, in short, the father of the no, of prohibition. First, as the no of the father, then as the name of the father. This is that motherfucker. This is the motherfucker we're talking about. And let me be clear and let me be literal. This is the motherfucker. All he does all day long apparently is fuck all the mommies. This bit about him as the keeper of the no. This bit about the father of the primal horde as the one who's responsible, the agent of everyone else's castration in this myth, is absolutely key 
to what's happening here. In order for any totalizing complete set of everything to hold together, you've heard me say, here all men, nothing must be left out. Nothing must be excluded from its count of everything. I don't think I'll ever tire of saying that. The father, whose escape from the phallic function, as represented in the second formula we just considered, the father whose escape from the phallic function structures, conditions, and guarantees all men's subjection to the phallic function is just that, a figure of nothing relative to social order. This father, the father of the primal horde, is nothing but a signal and source of a no thing, of prohibition of the phallic function itself. That's why this is such a great move that Lacan is making here. The one who is ejected from or excluded, if you like that, that's a better, better Latin working there around exclusion, the kind of cutting out. The one who is cut out from the set of everything. And by the way, this is also the one that guarantees that the set remains incomplete, that never actually can perform its function because one is always left out. This is partly why the one is so important to what Lacan is getting into in his later thought, is that this one that has to be excluded from the totalizing set of everyone is proof that the totalizing set of everyone, like the big other, is barred is lacking because there's always one that doesn't fit, that has to be kicked out in order for the totalization to occur in a valid way. It's a logical game that he's working. And once your brain wraps around that logic, all of his thinking along these lines just falls right into place. This is how he is thinking, logics of meta-language, the big other, the real father, here the father of the primal horde, as mythologized. The father who escapes the phallic function, the same father who structures, conditions, and guarantees all men's subjection to that phallic function, this is the same father who stands as nothing and pronounces that no thing, inaugurating the castrative logic to which everyone except him is somehow subject. Now, when we add all of this up, when we stack these two formulas atop each other, and here I'm kind of anticipating a little bit of where Lacan's going, but still remaining squarely in chapter 8, when we stack up these two formulas for masculine subjectivities, as Lacan will go on to do, we arrive at a summative statement about masculine identities, at least what I believe to be a summative statement. You can disagree with me, and we'll chop it up. But I read this as a fairly summative statement of what Lacan means by man, how he understands masculine subjectivities here in 1970. Bear in mind, I am not delivering a lecture here on Seminar 20. This is a lecture on Seminar 18. Here's how I read this. It's simple. All men except one are defined by the phallic function. All men except one are castrated. That's how we read these two formulas when you stack them on top of each other. All men are subject to the phallic function, except one man who is not subject to the phallic function. That's what you read in these two formulas. Which means that there's always some one beyond phallic surplus jouissance for men. And this is a key point. For men, there's always someone, some other man, who is not subject to the castrative logics that the rest of us are. The big daddy, the big dog, the mythical father of the primal horde, who just, I mean, it's a ridiculous image, enjoying all the women exclusively. It's just hilarious in some way. The idea here is that if all men except one are defined by the phallic function, that means that one man in particular has escaped castration. It means that there's someone beyond phallic surplus jouissance that men are constantly dreaming about. I think that's a very important part of this. 
Men fantasize about other men. Straight men, ostensibly, fantasize about this other man who enjoys without limitation, who is not castrated, who fucks all the women. You could see how this kind of heteronormative, hyper-straight, yet thoroughly homoerotic fantasy would play out. I mean, just look at most pornography of the hetero stripe and you'll see this shit playing out. Because for men, there's always somebody beyond the limited castrated form of jouissance, the member or part enjoyment, the organ enjoyment that men are subjected to. Here, this person is figured as the mythical, phantasmatic, existent, ecstatic, dick-swinging, long, bald father of the primal horde. You can figure this however you want, but this is one of the fundamental fantasies that you see popping in masculinized subjectivities for Lacan. It's the fantasy that there's always somebody who has escaped castration. And then the question becomes, how close can I approximate that? How can I get like you know as close as possible to enjoying all the women? And you can kind of spin it out from there. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on that. Again, because we're just sticking with what Lacan is up to in Chapter 8 of Seminar 18. But I want to start putting us on the path of masculinity as he understands it and the fantasies contained therein. At this point in his thought, or at least I think what we can say at this point in Seminar 18, his thoughts on women are quite a bit less developed, at least on my read. Or, or at least he's, he's less plainly stated around how he's understanding feminine subjectivities in chapter 8 of Seminar 18. He does, however, hit us with one of the two basic formulas for feminine subjectivity that he's going to later develop. You see it in chapter 8. It's on page 17 or 151 in the PDF. It's this wild thing where you've got Backwards, capital E, X, with a line over it, meaning negation, next to the figure of the phallic function, again with a line over it. How are we to understand this? Well, if you read this thing literally to the letter, here's what you can say about this pure writing. Literally, there is not one woman who is not defined by the phallic function, namely by castration. That's what the line above the EX says. The backwards EX says there is not one woman. There is not some woman who is not defined by the phallic function. Now, I don't find those double negatives very helpful, but there's a reason why Lacan is stating it that way. Lacan has to state it that way to keep this from passing fully into the field of the symbolic. We'll come to that. We'll come to that. But right now, I think what we can say is there's a better way, a more clarifying way to make sense of this formula for feminine subjectivities that he is hitting us with at the end of chapter 8. Here's how I read it. Here's the bumper sticker for this particular formulation. Look far and near, as hard as you like, but you'll never find a woman who isn't at least partially defined by the phallic function. This is how I read this formula. Look wherever you want. Interview all the women in the, in the primordial father's horde of women. Interview them all, and you'll never find one who isn't at least partially defined by the phallic function. Now, here's a part that I just find ridiculous. And it kind of makes me not even want to talk about this shit anymore. But So you're telling me that we have a father of the primal horde. And this father is the one who escapes the totalizing count of castrated men and all this bullshit. Okay, got it, got it. Uh, but there's no mother of the primal horde. Now, maybe you're going to say, well, that's because it's all the mommies. All the mommies are the mother of the blah, blah, blah. But I think it's very revealing here and kind of ridiculous if you think about this, that there's one daddy for everybody in this myth, but there's not one mommy 
that would have gotten all the other women you know, birthed into this world. In other words, why is there a father of the primal horde, but not a mother of the primal horde? And maybe the answer is numerical and obvious. I think that's one way to read this, but I find it just ridiculous here, this dilemma that there is not one woman who isn't at least partially defined by the phallic function. You see how we're reading this? You catching this? The father of the primal horde is the one man who escapes castration, who is not even partially castrated. And what Lacan is here suggesting is that there is no equivalent to that in the field of feminine subjectivity. There is no woman who has escaped fully the castrative logic that we see in the phallic function here, represented by this I with a circle in it and then X beside it. There is not one woman who isn't, to some extent, subject to castration. We have one man who isn't, but there's not one woman who isn't. That's the part that I find kind of ridiculous here. Lacan might need to meet a few more women. He doesn't get much further than this in chapter 8, and I'm kind of glad he doesn't because, you know, like I said, it's kind of frustrating for me as the father of a daughter whom I hope grows into a certain uh, type of woman uh, to hear this stuff, to read this stuff. Um, logically, I get it, but there's something about how he's working this that I don't quite buy. I think there's a bit of bullshit happening here. Now, maybe I'll be proved wrong. Maybe by the end of 18, I'll be on board. Maybe as we get to seminar 19, maybe as we get to seminar 20, illustrious seminar 20, I'll finally be convinced. Logically, I see what he's up to. Existentially, I'm not buying it yet. So I'm glad that he doesn't get much further with his theory of feminine subjectivity here in chapter 8. He does, however, allude to something else. He hints at something and this something that he hints at, I believe, is the second formula of subjectivity that he would later go on to develop. This is the one that I'm holding up to you now. You have your upside down A next to X with a line over the top of it, which negates the universal claim, all women. There is not all women. And then you have the paternal phallic function next to it, the castrative logical no of the father. And the way I read this formula, that's not mentioned in eight, although I think he's hinting at it, is that not every part of every woman is wholly defined by the phallic function. So all women are partially defined by the phallic function, but there's no woman who is wholly part wholly defined by the phallic function. Not every part of every woman is wholly defined by the phallic function. Now, what happens when we add these two formulas together? The one he presents us with and the one he alludes to. I think when you add these two together, you have a fairly clear, coherent, and accessible statement on feminine subjectivity, at least to get the conversation going. And let's be very, very pointed about this. I think this is where the conversation begins. What eventually arrives in Seminar 20 is getting started here in Seminar 18, masculine and feminine subjectivities as formulated in the field of pure writing by what I've been holding up to you in the form of these upside down and reverse letters. Sticking with the two formulas for feminine subjectivity, here's how I think it stacks up. If we could put a bumper sticker to this, it would sound like follows. All women are at least partially defined by the phallic function, but no one woman is wholly defined by the phallic function. So you can look near and far, and you will not find a woman who is not at least partially defined by the phallic function. But here's the thing, you can also look near and far. You can interview all the mommies and you will not find one of them who is wholly defined by the phallic function. All men are wholly defined by the phallic function, except one. There is no woman, however, who is wholly defined by the phallic function. That's how I'm reading these two formulas together. 
all women are a little bit, to some extent, defined by the phallic function. Maybe to a lot extent defined by the phallic function. But no woman, no one who occupies the position of feminine subjectivity for Lacan is wholly and completely defined by the phallic function the way men are. Notice how this stacks up as we bring men and women together, which doesn't constitute a sexual rapport, by the way. For men, there's always someone beyond phallic jouissance. We know who that someone is, this uncut daddy who's out there with his uncut daddy dick enjoying all of the women. For women, there's always something beyond phallic jouissance. That's the important thing here. For men, there's always someone beyond the phallic jouissance to which they are subjected. For women, there's always something more to their sexuality than phallic jouissance. There is something more to feminine subjectivity than phallic jouissance can account for. Women are not just castrated. What we see here, what I think Lacan is alluding to in this something beyond phallic jouissance is an unnamed, fiercely ulterior, an utterly real point of access that you know how he's going to describe later. He's going to call it an other jouissance. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, but I think we're right on the edge here. My question would be, which edge? Which tidal zone do we now find ourselves in as we're thinking through this unnameable, wildly ulterior, utterly real point of access to a type of jouissance that is not phallic, but something else, something else entirely. It's a great place for us to pause.